Ladies and gentlemen, the topic is nurturing India's future stars, for which I would like to invite on stage once again, Mr. Pulela Gopichand, Chief National Coach for Indian National Badminton Team, to join us. Please welcome him with a thunderous round of applause. Mr. Pulela Gopichand, welcome you, sir. He is the former Indian badminton player, of course, and is currently the chief national coach for the Indian national badminton team. He won the All England Open Badminton Championships in the year 2001, becoming the second Indian to achieve this feat after Prakash Padukone. He received the Arjuna Award in the year 1999 and Dronacharya Award in the year 2009 and the Padma Bhushan, India's third, third highest civilian award in 2014. Please welcome him with a thunderous round of applause. He's already with us on stage, Mr. Pulela Gopi Chan. It is such a pleasure to have you on stage here with us and we are looking forward to hear your thoughts on this changing dynamic sports uh, ecosystem. And sir, we'll be in conversation with Mr. Ayon Mr. Ayon Sen Gupta from Sports Star, the Hindu's multi-sport magazine in 2008, a football enthusiast. He has reported and written on sports extensively for Sports Star and the Hindu. Please welcome him. He's now the editor of Sports Star, both print and online. Welcome you, Mr. Ayon. And I would now request you to kindly initiate the dialogue. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here in Delhi, despite the cold. Uh, and thank you, Gopi, to actually braving the cold and the Delhi traffic to be here with us this morning. Uh, I know uh, the Indian Open is on, and you have a very, very busy schedule. A lot of Indians are in the fray today, but thank you so much for being here. Uh, so I think let's dive into the questions uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, yesterday, we saw Sindhu losing a very, very uh, close game, and then we saw Saina struggling but managed to win her game. So my first question for the day would be, who do you think is going to be India's next big singles hope in badminton, in women's badminton, that is? Very good morning to all of you. It's really nice to be here. Um, well, for me, I think Indian badminton, if you look at over the years, has done very well. Um, we've had some great performances from the players. And I do see a whole bunch of players coming up. The last two years uh, has been bad for the sport, not necessarily from a senior perspective, uh, senior player perspective, but especially for the juniors, because many of them have lost the tournaments, which were the transition tournaments between the juniors and the seniors. So you might actually see, take a little bit of time before actually seeing the names. Uh, we have about nine players in the top 100 of the world only in women's singles. I think uh, there's a lot of talent there and all of the players are, are young. They're under the age of 21. So I do hope, uh, hope that um, a few of them make up the notch. I'm just not taking a name in particular because I risk missing out a few. So for that reason, but there are nine in the top 100. So you can imagine there is definitely talent coming in. And I do expect some of them to break in. And some of them are in the borders of the 100 as well. So I just have a lot of talent. And um, maybe another year or so, you can see some names come up there. Okay. That's, that's actually very good to know. Uh, producing champions uh, who can beat the best takes a collective effort. We all know even you struggle when you set up the Gopicha and the Academy. Even you struggled in terms of funds and all that. So here we are with the best of the corporate world. I mean, who always talks about return of investment and that to a very quick ROI. So what would be your pitch to corporate India to come and support multiple sports? Well, I think, um, to be fair, I think there's been a decent amount of support in the last few years uh, for sport in general. Uh, we've had, um, in badminton itself, we, whether it's the Tatas, whether it's uh, the Koteks, Dalmias, um, IDBI Federal, they've actually put in decent amount of money. There's also, when we look at foundations which work at grassroots level, I see a lot of them. I am part of one of them, ELMS Foundation, where um, Jalaj uh, Bai and uh, Mistani here are there. We've been part of grassroots level sport. 
with a lot of emphasis. Reliance has put in uh, uh, some funds there. So I think a lot of corporate India is also looking at sport. I think when we want performances, we have to grow infrastructure. That's one definitely which is important. But also the need to have parallelly a structure for all of sport. Infrastructure, coaches and support staff, policies, yeah. all of them have to go hand in hand. At the moment in some sports, we've built the infrastructure, like in badminton, just to put things in perspective. We in the last, say, five years, have improved our infrastructure tremendously. Today, in maybe 2008, 9, if there were 50 players playing, today there are 10,000 players playing. So the growth in the sport has been enormous in the sense we can, and I can just give you one, share one example. When I was playing um, in Hyderabad uh, in 85, and that continued all the way till about 2000, we had less than 10 badminton courts in the entire city. And today, there are no less than 3,000 badminton courts in the entire city. So you're looking at infrastructure which has grown, not gradually over time, but all the 3,000 or 2,900 have come in the last five years. So we have actually grown tremendously. And there are many cities like that, like Bangalore has grown tremendously. Yes, Bombay um, may be a bit of an um, issue with uh, the space, but uh, Delhi has also had so many more badminton courts which have come up. Infrastructure has grown. Parallelly on that side, we don't produce enough coaches. We haven't grown enough in that. We have 10,000 players playing. But Sports Authority of India or the NIS program still produces 18 coaches in two years' time. And like you, you literally have, they won't even take one colony. I think five courts will need those. And I think the NIS coaching program is also not very, it's not sports specific. It's, uh, I mean, you, the first few years you do everything and then you get into a specialization. Yeah, I think, uh, I wouldn't say it's bad. But I think whatever it is, just the numbers are less, too less, too less for our country at the way we are growing sport, we are not growing that. And the other bigger concern for me is, when I was growing up, we had 50 players playing, we had 20 jobs. And to be honest, I wouldn't have continued playing the sport. I, I finished my um, inter uh, or the 12th class. I was a maths, physics and chemistry student. Um, I was, like all Telugu people, we had only two professions, either you're a doctor or an engineer. So I was also in the same boat. I wrote my exams, luckily I failed. <laughs> and my parents said, you start playing this year, if you get good results and if you get a job, you can continue playing. Because uh, my problem was my brother went to IIT. So the standards <laughs> at home were very different. So. That year, I won my junior nationals. More importantly, I got a job in Tata Steel. Okay. And I think that was actually the beginning of my badminton career. So in some sense, a lot of us look for a job security as such. Yeah. Because in sport, we have inspired 10,000 people to play the sport. Saina, Sindhu, Shrikant, Satvik, Chirag, they're Lakshya Sen, the Pranoy, the play people who have performed well. India's Thomas Cup win this year has inspired another 1,000 2,000 players in every city to take up the sport. Everybody is excited. Build stadiums, play the sport. Fantastic. Now, my jobs are 20. And what happens to the 95% of the people who don't make it to the top? Yeah. And if this generation of people are left like that, the next generation of parents are actually going to say, what's the use of playing sport? Nalayak banatu. And this is the problem we are actually facing. And we need to address this now. It's not that I will address it later. Because at the moment, what's happening is our entire ecosystem is saying that 1% is important. Yeah. The Department of Sport, the, f the people here sitting in the room, everybody says that 1% is important. But yes, these people are also important because unless the entire ecosystem is taken care of, yeah. We are not actually going to do justice and this whole thing is going to fall flat very soon. So I think it's very important that we address of the coaches and support staff, we address 
the other players who don't make it it was equally important and then what happens to their careers we need to actually take care of the entire group and that would be very important i mean it's a, uh, it's great that you touched upon employment uh, even now i think if you look at hockey if you look at table tennis and even badminton someone like lakshya uh, is employed by a uh, oil psu so do you think indian players are still looking for that post retirement job security or they can actually now see sports as a profession where they only play sports and don't have to think about a job have we reached that point for non cricket sport in the country well not yet i think um i think um we are talking about lakshya sen who's been um in the top 10 of the world yeah yeah maybe he can survive without a job but the guys who are after him and after him don't have a job okay. and they've invested the best part of their life playing for the sport playing representing the state representing the country aspiring to make the dreams of a billion indians into a medal but if these guys are not going getting any jobs then it's a cause of concern okay. i think maybe the top guy has the advertisement he will he can go to people and figure things out for him he could probably open an academy he could find another way to live his life but what about the rest of them who don't make it and it's a case of concern i'm saying just think of it and and uh, numbers wise we are excited mericom plays for 20 years right uh, sushil played for 10 15 years we have leander played for 24 years we have sharath now playing for in tt playing for yeah. good two decades some of these categories mirabai chanu is one of them i could take an example you only have slot for one person at the olympics yeah. the number 2 in the slot is not there and if that is the way it is then then i think the guy who's number 2 could be very good who's invested who's worked really hard who's talented will never see a rupee in his life he will never see any sunlight in his life and then he is always depressed saying mere ko kuch nahi mila sport mein and that's the concern which i have we need to kind of address that and that needs to be broad i'm not saying give everybody jobs i'm saying skill them figure a way out you need to have universities which need to skill these people we are not adaptive and nobody likes to leave sport we all love sport we get a lot of good good focus and dopamine by playing sport so yeah. we don't want to leave sport but i think if you're not making it to the top cut what is your alternate profession it's not only sports marketing or sports coaches i think you could do be anything but give the opportunity have universities which have foundation years which teach them you take them in other professions you you invite them lower the standards of others and and i'm saying you you're saying railway job is good enough you're saying boss why not are we not good enough to be an ias officer are we not good enough to be an ias officer or a marketing guy and what we say is railways ka job le lo bank ka job le lo and you are always talking at the lower level you get these guys jobs yeah. why can't the sports authority be headed by a sports person why are the ministry not headed by it why is states associations not why so that's the point in the sense don't say that sportsmen just because they don't have a degree are not intelligent enough to take on any other jobs just put them up there so don't give us those clerical jobs and stay you suffer for life in this and and then the next generation say oh, i don't want to and it's an also a case of concern because when i was growing up i lived in a rented apartment and for me to buy a two bedroom flat and have a tata steel job was motivation enough but today you're looking at middle class playing sport you're looking at upper middle class playing sport that the kid is asking at 7 and i was not i was dumb and I, that's why i play, played sport because i didn't ask this question what about my career but today my son will ask this question what will i get if i play if i if i am living in a villa will i make enough in my life to actually live this life and the question for many of us is no and i think for that reason i think we need to really relook at sport because there's a middle class and an upper middle class and the rich who need to play sport and we need to redefine the way sports persons are looked at not just the 1% but at least the top 20% i think that's important for us to but, take care of but as as a coach or someone who run multiple successful academy i mean this holistic growth of your students i mean where uh, the sportsman's life is i mean there are always disappointments so how do you train an athlete athlete for that the disappointments which might come i mean 
as you said, only one person or two person will go and uh, be a successful athlete, not, not the 98 person who's, who's in the academy. So how do you... Uh, the reality is when you say the success, you've counted probably I'm, I'm very successful in producing maybe 20 players, but there are probably 2,000 who, who, who have trained and not succeeded. And uh, in the initial years, my focus was only on the 10 percent or the 20 people whom I was coaching. But really, when you look at the ecosystem and sustainability, I believe you need to go deeper. We cannot have this, this kind of disparity. We need a deeper system. And I'm really happy for what IPL does. It, it at least grows that pool. You have other leagues which actually grow, whether it's the Kabaddi League or whether it's the Football League. Very successful leagues which happen, badminton, TT, uh, all of these leagues actually grow. But I would really love to see the fastest person in the country, Indian male athlete, the fastest marathon runner in the country, be celebrated more, rewarded more. Not necessarily you compare always to the world standards, but every city starts looking at small ways in funding. I would like best runner of Hyderabad, best runner of Delhi. I think why can't these people earn a decent living? Because they are still, we are still competing against a decent population. And these isolated or small, small breakups of the country and say best Gujarati guy, best Andhra guy, best the best uh, Kannadi guy, best Kurgi. I think just break it up and celebrate those successes and don't always compare uh, world standards so, to India. So you're standards saying that both, both as advertisers and media, we need to get back and cover more of state sports and national sports, which probably in the 80s and 90s we used to do much better. Yeah, 100%. Because you look at the front page, it's all local news. You look at the badge back page, it's EP, uh, EPL news. <laughs> I said, boss, it's like all news is local. Sports news, you just want global. When I was young, I would go back and check, boss, my name is in the newspaper or not. Today, we don't have any local sport being covered at all. And that's a big concern because we go back and see the last pages and say it's EPL transfers taking half the page. I said, boss, what about our, our sport? What about our kids who have won? It's a district tournament. I used to have, I, it was a huge motivation for me to see my paper and I would mark it, my mother would underline it and just show it. And that's a huge motivation and I really think we yeah. want it back. So, so demark spaces for local sport at the back of the space in the sense on the front page when you are putting only local news, why can't it be the same? And uh, that's something which I strongly feel about. So I think that, that's a message for us and I think, uh, uh, for example, Leander who grew up in, uh, uh, in Chennai uh, playing at the Amrit Raj Academy, you know him well. I think he won the Bertram tournament when he was 14 year old and I, uh, a, a cutting of a newspaper is still there in his wallet. Uh, I think a one para came in the newspaper that he won the Bertram tournament and he still keeps that. He says that that's his most cherished possession. It's as big for him as that Olympic medal. So for a youngster, I think it's a huge motivation if your name appears in a newspaper or if he's shown in a television even for a, a few seconds. Yeah, I think it's not only for the youngster instance, the parent is motivated because every parent is being told kya kar rahe tera bacha, kyun khel rahe? And then the kid is, the parents actually can show off and say to the relatives that my kid is in the newspaper and that's something good. My school, I would remember and we would go out and uh, the teacher would say, why didn't you come to class with homework and you get out of class and then at least I can show her boss <laughs> I won a tournament. So I think these are small motivations for the society and for the parents and yeah. for us. I think all of them, it makes a difference and it has to make a difference. It's not just the money which we earn because that's also not a barometer of checking how successful we are, but these soft things are important and we need to kind of look at these very, um, very objectively, which you have lost in the last few years. And I truly uh, am with Leander on this. I remember once and I, um, when I won the Austrian Open and I beat the um, uh, Olympic champion Paul Eric Hoyer last set. And this was the time when ISD used to be there. Yeah. And I uh, rang my mom just to check up, did it appear in the newspapers <laughs> next day? She said yes, just to keep, m keep me uh, happy, but actually it didn't. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it actually, all you, that little recognition does matter. So the, uh, 
I think right before that, we were uh, hearing about hockey. Uh, the Hockey World Cup is happening in Orissa, and I think uh, Orissa as a state, they have taken over hockey and has done wonderfully well since 2018. They have ensured that Indian hockey has regained a bit of its lost glory. Do you think that's the way forward for a lot of non-Olympic sports mm -hmm. to be get adopted by states and states pushing them forward? I think what Orissa has done is really fantastic. Um, and I think um, today, I think the various organizations and a lot of credit has to go to the government. I think Honorable Prime Minister, um, the Home Minister, they've been really pushing for sport. I think, this, I think if your top man is talking about sport so relentlessly, if he calls us up after a Thomas Cup and the PMO is like, when is the final? What is happening? We want to talk to the players immediately. And he meets you one-on-one -on -one like this for 15 of us, 10 of us who, who are genuinely interested in sport. Uh, and because the uh, PM himself is interested, nobody takes these things lightly. So I think there's a significant difference in the way sports is treated in the government uh, from the way it was in the past. So we are looking at um, this being very, very good. So you have also now moved into sports administration with your role at the, uh, uh, with VAI. And we have, uh, you were just talking about how more athletes <coughs> should come into sports administration. Uh, we have seen now PT Osha is heading the Indian Olympic Association, Kalyan Chobe is there in football, Dilip Turkey has just taken over hockey, obviously Saurav and now Roger Bini is uh, heading the BCCI. So as former players, uh, we were also talking about broad basing this fund which comes to sports. So as former players who knows the ecosystem better, what do you think you guys can do to channelize this fund that comes to sports in a better way that it reaches down to the, the last layer? I think one of the challenges we have in our sport ecosystem is that there's so many people who are coming into the ecosystem, right? So when I was, and this is like a 2004, um, uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, when the building stages of the badminton players were, nobody used, used to bother me. I never get a media interview. We would never have any sponsor coming, no manager coming. So, so nobody from Sai would call up. So we were at, like, I was in Gachibauli in Hyderabad with a bunch of players and we would train them. And we had just enough or we had less than enough. But I think sport, we could focus on the things which were required. So today what's happening and the reason why I even try to venture into a, a field like administration, which is not what I really want to do, is that today you have NGOs come into sport, you have sports marketing guys come into sports, you have the leagues come into sport, you have government associations, physiologists, psychologists, physiotherapists, sports medicine doctors, all of them come in. And there are a bunch of them who have come into sport in the last few years, but the system to coordinate each of them was not there. In the sense, and that's the bigger challenge. That the, we have people like uh, everybody wants to do Olympic sport and to do the elite sport. We want to have an Olympic medal. But how do you coordinate between all of the good intentioned people is one of the challenges which I think Indian sport really faces. There's no leadership to ensure that you're streamlining these things which are very essential. Each one is on their own path and that's disastrous. And it's also not that you can find a common path for all because uh, badminton is, has to be dealt very differently than a tennis or a table tennis or a cricket or a athletics. And each athlete has to be dealt differently than the others. So I think there is a lot of kind of different pathways which are needed. But surely there is fixing of accountability which is the key point. And I don't think we're still anywhere close to getting that in place. And I think, uh, if anything, I think that will be the biggest challenge we're going to face. And I think hopefully with all these sports persons coming together, I think we will have to sort these out. But democracy also has its own pitfalls. So you want to trust people and say, boss, you are in charge for the next few years, you get me the medals. I think that kind of a freedom and accountability is needed for us to go forward. I'm not very comfortable with debating and discussing and and uh, same democracy for all because sometimes it just doesn't work. You just need quick action 
And the other point uh, just to mention is that all of them in sport are looking for short term benefits and all of them have a short tenure. Your bureaucrat, your minister, your government, the, the advertiser, all of them are saying I want one year, two years. Sport is long term and uh, we need to have those thinking long term and not short term. So do you think the, uh, when you're talking about long term, the 10 years also, the new sports court which has been there, the tenure of sports administrators has been... Uh, That's a tricky point. I won't, <laughs> don't want to get into it. For the last 10, 11, 12 years now, I think 2011, the sports yeah, court had absolutely. come. Till now, there's still doubt as to what it really means. Yeah. So I think but, I, but, I would rather but, just skip this. But coming into administration, I mean, do you think you need at least a 10-year or a 12-year window to actually make a difference? Yes, I do think. I do think it's important. And more importantly, it's not about India, right? So you want India to be at the global level in world sport. You, you need years for these guys from India to go to the global stage, build relationships, and actually be decision makers at the world level. Mm. And that's what the growth of the sport should be. It's not about fighting uh, us. And if you keep moving, churning people over every few years, that you actually risk the problem <coughs> that you might get nobody at the highest level. So I think that's, that's a problem. Uh, I don't have an easy solution to it. Neither am I saying that the way federations were run till today was great. But I think uh, there's no easy answer. And we need to find the right people, entrust them with the job, and then make them accountable for the results. That's the way I would look at it. But definitely, we need to be there at the helm of affairs at the world level. And shorter durations don't help. OK. And I think uh, we obviously are Star Sports, which is the biggest broadcast sports board broadcaster in the country. Uh, we were just discussing in terms of badminton. It's it's a it, the games are usually short. A match is about between 30 to 50 minutes at best, sometimes even shorter. Uh, and there are not uh, and the gap also between points are very very short. So you can't really squeeze in an advertising break, which is very very important for television. I mean, cricket probably is so popular because after every over, you get a minute to have as many ads as possible. So. Do you think uh, uh, sports, uh, other sports, non-cricket sports also need to figure out a way how they can make it a little more attractive for, for broadcasters, for television audience? I think badminton has been struggling for, with this for a very, very long time as well at the international level. Well, when Sindhu played the Rio Olympics, I think uh, it was bigger viewership than what cricket had yeah. for a long time. Yeah, so <laughs> I would think that you would want to. Or when hockey played its um, semi-final, I think it was. Yeah. When golf was at the Olympics at 4 a.m. in the morning, Aditi was playing. Or we I saw lawn bowls this year at the Commonwealth Games. I think we, lead, we want Indians winning at the highest stage, and we will watch it any which way. And I think gaps or no gaps, it doesn't make a difference. So I think to get the Indians at the highest levels, beat the other people in the world, I think is what's going to make the sport popular. And I do believe that India has enough population which is going to watch all sports, they're mad fanatics and mad Indians uh, in terms of nationality. So I do believe that there's a huge hope and I don't think sport has to really tinker with it. I do believe that we need to produce top players and stars from India and Indians will watch. If Indians are running, imagine if Indians were to compete in a marathon. Uh, yeah. I think if we are in the top of the marathon or we, would, we are running the 100 meters race of the world, I think we definitely have enough people who are crazy about the sport. So I do believe, yes, there is definitely some element, but I don't think that's a big hindrance. Can we take one or two questions for him from the audience, if anybody has anything to ask? Would that be all right? Do we have time for that? Actually, we are running uh, okay. past the time. Okay. Thank you so much, Gopi. It was a Thank lovely you. conversation. Thank you for coming here. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gopi Chand and Mr. Sain Gupta for joining us here. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I would request Mr. Sain Gupta to kindly present a token of appreciation, a memento to Mr. Pulela Gopi Chand for joining us here this morning, sharing his thoughts on uh, the changing landscape of sporting ecosystem in the country and. Uh, Yes, that 1% to 20% translation that he talked about, we really hope that we see that in the coming few years. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause, Mr. Pulela Gopichand and Mr. Ansain Gupta. Thank you. Thank you so much.